Okay, we're here for another podcast. Um, today we're with uh, Mr. Simon Moyes, who I've worked with for many years. Yeah. Um, and we're here to talk about meniscal tears, which is one of the most common conditions we see, but also one of the most co- common conditions where we work together to try and get patients better. So, should we just start with an introduction, Simon? Do you want to give us an idea of that? Uh... I'm Simon Moyes. I'm a consultant orthopaedic surgeon here at the Cromwell. Uh, I'm a founder of Capital Orthopaedics, which is a group of like-minded orthopaedic surgeons and sports medicine physicians, and I've been working with Chris and Complete for many years now. Yes, certainly quite a few years. So we're going to get into the nitty-gritty of meniscal tears, but we're going to start with some of the sort of more basic questions that patients often have or what uh, may be relevant to their condition. So what is the meniscus, first of all? So each knee has two menisci or meniscuses, an inside one and an outside one. Um, I'll show you here on the model. And the meniscus is uh, shaped like a new moon and it's a rubbery, it's a rubbery shock absorber. You have a big one on the inside and a more mobile, smaller one on the outside of the knee. And they are rubbery, rubbery shock absorbers. Uh, they're stabilizers for the knee or secondary stabilizers for the knee and they also have a role in helping to maneuver the lubricating fluid, the synovial fluid around inside the joint. Perfect. And so we've got one on the inside which is the medial meniscus Correct. and the one on the outside is the lateral. The Correct. medial is the bigger one. The lateral one which we're definitely going to come on to is smaller but more mobile right. and, and can particularly be a problem. Um, so that's the role of it. So how do you injure it? Who gets it? Who injures this meniscus? How does it happen? There's really two main uh, groups of people that injure their menisci. So there's the younger, fit, active person that has a big, acute injury, maybe skiing or part of a football injury or part of a fall down the stairs, you know, a big, acute injury. There's, you know, they remember a specific event mm. uh, when they something happened inside their knee. There was acute pain, often a, a popping sensation or a tearing sensation in their knee. The knee becomes very painful and difficult to walk on afterwards. The knee swells up typically within a few hours. They're limping around, it doesn't settle, and they continue to have quite focal pain over where where the meniscus is torn. They have a sensation of weakness in the knee. It feels difficult typically going downstairs, Mm -hmm. dealing with stairs, turning corners. That's, That's one group. And the other group is much more my generation, uh, whereby... And my generation too. My, so it's called more age-related wear and tear changes. And as, as we get older, our meniscus gets generally a bit more fragile and soggy and it gets fat infiltration into it, it becomes far less rubbery. So it loses its shock absorption and cushioning. And the free edge of it, which should be shaped like the edge of a, a, a new moon, becomes frayed like a the bottom of an old pair of jeans and it starts mm. to rip and shred and that can happen and they slowly develop similar but much less severe symptoms mm. so they get more nigglesome symptoms building up typically over a, a few weeks or months and they come in to you or me uh, or their GP or anyone saying you know I've got I've got this pain and it's sore and it they have fewer mechanical symptoms really more just generalized aching swelling some stiffness they do get some clicking from time to time. It's not a big issue, and they but they don't record a specific event. So th- th- those are the two yeah. main groups of patients. Yeah. So we've we got see. that uh, that where somebody's had it, and generally in the younger patient, you've had that sudden incident where you've got a, a, a tearing incident, mm-hmm. so you, that acute tear, and then you've got that degenerative or wear and tear type presentation yeah. in the older client. And obviously, I, I assume there's some overlap in there sometimes yeah, obviously, as yeah. well. Yeah. So should we deal with them? Because they are actually, if we think about it, they are, they're dealt with quite differently, aren't they? Absolutely. So I think we should talk about, let's talk about the first one. So that's the younger sort of meniscal tear, so where you've had that acute incident. So do you want to give us a bit more of an idea? You've already said about twisting injuries and that sort of thing and how they present. Um, So what happens actually when you get a tear? Is it on the inside, outside, and, and what do you do about it? So the anatomy or three-dimensional architecture of the meniscus is actually quite complicated. And I don't want to baffle uh, the audience with too much uh, science, but enough to say that the meniscus is divided into uh, a front, middle, and back zone. 
and an inner, middle, and outer zone. Yep. And uh, as you, those different zones can have different types of tears, and those tears can run in different planes. Um, so without getting too complicated, tears in certain zones of the meniscus are much more amenable to repair rather than uh, non-operative treatment, if, yeah. if, if for want of a better way of going about it without complicating it too yeah. much. So basically you've got that, that moon shape and depending on where the tear is depends on potentially how you m- how you manage it yeah. does that also link because a lot of patients will say well i've been told i've got a meniscal tear so an acute tear is it going to get better is it going to heal itself does that relate into the zones as well yes absolutely so the take home message is that you do not want to lose the shock absorbing uh, shock absorbing capacity of your meniscus because if you do particularly if you're young, and by young I mean 20s, 30s, even early yeah. 40s, if you lose the shock absorption of your meniscus, then you've got about a 60% chance of the knee becoming arthritic in a 10-year period. Yeah. So we have to, as clinicians, do everything we can to preserve the meniscal function as best we can. Mm. So when you see someone who presents, particularly young, with a, an acute meniscal tear, you need to work out the best ways to preserve that meniscus. And so you have to think to yourself, is this torn meniscus going to heal on its own? Yeah. Or is this torn meniscus going to require arthroscopic surgery to repair it? Yeah. So there's quite a lot to consider, isn't yeah. there? Certainly yeah. when I start, I mean, I've, I've had a meniscectomy and one of our physios has had a meniscectomy and I've seen lots of people that have had meniscectomies in their sort of, well, one guy was in their teens, teens 20s, 30s, and they all they're all developing, including myself mm. on the inside of my knee, arthritis. Mm. So 20, 10 years ago, the idea was just to, if you like, resect, tidy mm. up the meniscus, have a meniscectomy, and then see how you get on. But now we've got that knowledge that you are quite likely, you said 60%, mm. particularly in those active people, yeah. to then develop arthritis as a result of that. So we need to try and preserve it if we yeah. can. The other thing about or the importance of repairing the meniscus or preserving the meniscal function is that not only do you protect against osteoarthritis later, Mm. you're more likely to get back to the level of activity that you were enjoying before if you can preserve it. Right. And uh, you're going to have less less pain and better function if you can preserve it. So, you know, preservation is the name of the game really here. Absolutely. So let's, how would an acute meniscal tear present in your clinic? Um, An isolated meniscal tear, this is without an associated ligament injury, would be a a football injury, a fall, uh, they might do it boxing in the gym, doing some training, or you know it can be just just an awkward twisting injury going up and down. Stepping off a step and yeah. yeah. So they'll present a sudden sudden pain, often a tearing sensation, something that will cause cause them to often you know scream out in pain they know they've had an acute injury they'll have difficulty weight bearing afterwards they'll notice that the knee is swollen after a few hours it, they hope that it will settle it usually doesn't or partially does and then two weeks later they're still in trouble yeah yeah the more extreme versions is when the meniscus tears so much that part or all of the meniscus can displace inside the knee and you can end up with what's called a locked knee. And this means that the knee won't fully straighten and won't fully bend. And that's because the meniscus becomes basically jammed inside the knee and it goes from its normal position and it sort of bucket handles over yeah. into the middle of the knee. So it- You is, just can't is, straighten the yeah. knee then. You cannot straighten the knee, yeah. And you can't bend the knee all the way. Yeah, yeah. And then that becomes a surgical emergency. Yeah. and. Uh, you have to obviously get them into clinic, scan them, and then uh, arthroscopically relocate the uh, dislocated meniscus yeah. and ideally repair it. Yeah. But sometimes it's not repairable, and then you have to resect it. So, but yeah. that, that, that's how the acute tears So present. that acute locked knee that you just can't bend or straighten at all, yeah. essentially that needs, th- th- those patients end up in A&E, don't they, yeah. sometimes? Uh, they? Urgent surgery. And if they're going to have surgery, it needs to be done quite quickly to help preserve Certainly, the cartilage? Yeah. 
I mean, I've had some people that have struggled with uh, bucket handle tears for a year, amazingly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, because NHS waiting lists are dreadful. But yeah. I mean, I, ideally, the sooner you repair them, the better the results. Yeah, yeah absolutely. OK, so and you, we talked at the beginning that there's two meniscus, or menisci. Yeah. <laughs> um, the medial and the lateral. Yeah. So what we've just talked about there with, and obviously that's medial is pain on the inside and uh, lateral is pain on the outside. Yeah. Does it change if it's medial or lateral in the case of an acute meniscal tear? No. 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 It's, they, it's, they, they all need repairing acutely if you yeah. can, yeah. Okay. So how are you going to get that diagnosis that you've got an c- acute meniscal tear? They've come into your clinic and obviously you're very suspicious from your clinical examination. What's the next stage diagnostically to gain that information that you need about the zones and what you're going to do? MRI. Yeah. MRI scan. So we're very lucky here. We have... Uh, in immediate access to MRI scans. So we, in my clinic every day, we have five or six MRI slots. Yeah. So patients can come in, they get history taken by me, they get examined by me or one of my colleagues, and they go straight into the MRI scanner, straight back, we see them afterwards, yeah. uh, look at the images on the screen together, uh, often with the radiologist, yeah. and decide what sh- pattern of tear it is and in what area of the meniscus it is and how we're gonna manage them. Right, yeah, perfect. And that's what's great here is you've got that ability just to, that one-stop mm. clinic really, yeah. isn't it, to get yeah. the information. Yeah. And if we are saying it is, you know, it is partly time dependent, there's no doubt about it, yeah. it's important to get that information yeah. as soon as possible. So from the MRI, we've talked a little bit about the zones. So my uh, my understanding is that it's to do with blood supply partly to the meniscus. Can yes. you talk us through that? Certainly, it used to be. I don't know if I'm yes. fully up to date. No, but. you're completely up to date, I'm sure. So <laughs> uh, when you look at this meniscus, in cross-section, it looks like a, a, a longitudinal triangle. Out towards the edge, it's thick and fat, and it's got a big fat blood supply. And on the inside, it becomes very thin, and it's got a very poor blood supply. So the ones that are repairable are the ones out towards the rim of the meniscus with the better blood supply. Yeah. You're Blue zone, red zone? Uh, was it blue and uh, it's, red? Uh, sort of, it's, like it's red, pink, and and, and white. <laughs> many so more as, colors, as, yeah. as you go as you go from the outside to the inside. Yeah. So the more peripheral you are with the meniscus, the more repairable they are. Right. Yeah. But more... obviously, if it's a bucket handle, then that's going to need an operation. Correct. Yeah. Something that's flipped yeah. over. Yeah. Okay. And so. So the, the, the corollary the corollary of that yeah. is that the smaller tears on the inner third of the meniscus where the meniscus is very thin and friable yeah they're not repairable right they're less severe then we're not so worried about them yeah. they will often settle down on their own right. uh the ones that don't you we, you can resect at a later date if necessary right okay but and the mri is going to give you that information the mri gives you a lot of information right. uh but the final arbiter, bizarrely, as to whether or not a meniscus is going to be repairable or not, is actually the arthroscopy. So once you've actually so gone once in there. you've decided that someone does need or may need a repair, yeah. you have to arthroscope them, put a camera in the knee, look at the meniscus, probe the meniscus carefully, work out is this tissue strong enough to be repaired, yeah. and then repair it. So so you're literally poking the meniscus. Yeah, yeah. We could make it sound more technical, yeah. but we won't. Poke the meniscus, and if it moves and it's not stable then does the meniscus uh, relocate back into the position it needs to be right does the tissue feel strong enough to be stitched yeah and then at the end of surgery at the end of surgery does it does the repair look strong enough to be sustainable yeah and that depends on people like me who do this all day long yeah yeah, yeah. so you certainly need to see somebody that's got that experience because quite sub sounds quite subjective when you say it like that yeah yeah Um, and I remember when I had mine done the surgeon said well I'm going to go he said exactly that I'm going to go in if I can repair it he actually said if I can repair it I will are you happy with that because the post-operative side of things Mm. is quite different and we'll come on to Mm. that um, but he said in the end, I'm too old and it looked, it didn't, it didn't look repairable. So he just cut it out and that's fine. Um, but obviously if you're younger than you, but, but I appreciate that as I get older, that probably means I'm going to have some medial compartment. So inside mm. osteoarthritis. Mm-hmm. So let's say you've gone in mm. and you've decided that you want to repair it. What do you actually do to the meniscus? So you counsel the patient very carefully as to whether you say that you're going to try and repair the meniscus. Mm. Um, and you talk the patient clearly through what the two processes involve, and what you do is you use a range of stitching techniques 
to hold the bits of the meniscus back in place. Right. So it's often, sometimes it can be simply like stitching a cut in the skin back yeah. together again. Sometimes though you're trying to reassemble bits of a jigsaw puzzle yeah. with the more complicated tears. Yeah. And you have to do different types of stitching for different shapes tear, shaped yeah, yeah. tears. Yeah, yeah. And so we have three real techniques. One is called the inside out technique, where as a, a, a device put a passes stitches in and the stitches get pulled out the other side yeah. to hold the meniscus in place. The other is a reverse when the stitches get passed through the meniscus from the outside and that's called outside in. Yeah. And then the last one is an all inside where you're putting a camera or a gun inside the meniscus which is firing firing stitches inside to stitch sort of grabbing it and putting it yes do you ever stitch to the bone like into to anchor it down that's great yes so for the for the real difficult tears back at the roots at the at the rear of the meniscus then we have to use bony tunnels and anchor anchor the meniscus back down onto the bone that's 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 a bit bit more complicated complicated. Mm. okay so let's say you've gone in and i'm sure there'll be people listening that are have been told exactly what you've said let's say that they do end up having a repair how does that look post operatively for that patient so this is the other thing you need to uh, spell out to uh, patients if they're having a simple meniscectomy in other words removing the torn fragment it's a very simple quick day case procedure they walk in and they limp out yeah and they're sore for two or three days and they, for a few days yeah, and then they get on with it yeah if they're having a meniscal repair, the bad news is, although the outcome is going to be great, typically, the downside is that for four weeks you're limping around on crutches in a knee brace, yeah. which is burdensome, boring. Yeah, <laughs> we boring. see those patients. You're on crutches, you're in a knee yeah. brace. How much weight you're allowed to put through the knee and how much range you're allowed in the knee depends upon the type of tear and the quality of the repair. Right, so that will vary yeah, actually. And that varies yeah. almost almost patient to patient. But you know, I always tell patients the worst case scenario, which is you're non-weight bearing for four weeks and you're in a knee brace locked at naught to 30 degrees. That's naught to so about 30 degrees. a little bend, yeah, yeah. yeah. So if, if they're forewarned as that's the worst scenario, then anything better than that is, is, is good news. Short term? Short term pain, pain long term long term gain. gain yeah. yeah, so we see we see the patients that you've operated mm-hmm. on, and um, I mean because they because you've taught them through it carefully, they're very aware of it. Yeah. But you know they do get frustrated, mm. and it takes time. And from a physio point of view, we're quite limited. We still can do things with them. Um, but whereas, as you say, with a meniscectomy or resection, you don't get that. You, as you say, I mean, I had one done, you know, after mm-hmm. three yeah. or four days, it's fine. But long term wise, obviously, it can compromise the, the integrity of the joint. Um, so with those, pa- let's just go through that in a bit more detail. Or just as a, uh, as you said, it varies from patient to patient. But let's say you come out, you've got your elbow, you've had you've had a repair. Mm-hmm. So you've got to look after those sutures because mm-hmm. the worst thing you can do is do too much on it. And you've essentially you've you've ruined the whole show haven't you yes so yeah. if you if you're disobedient <laughs> or uncompliant and you start walking around particularly without a brace or go beyond the range you're supposed to or take it off for whatever reason you can completely disrupt all the good yeah. that we've done so you're 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 ruining everything that we've yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so four to six weeks, you're probably not putting full weight through the leg. You're probably limited from naught to thirty, maybe increasing to naught yeah. to sixty, yeah. and then, yeah. and then what? Around two to three months, you're probably walking so, without crutches. So at four weeks, you come and uh, see your surgeon who's done your repair. Uh, he or she will typically unlock your brace, yeah. and then quite rapidly, you'll go from two crutches and a brace yeah. to no crutches and no brace and that process is supervised by the physiotherapist yeah, absolutely. and that, that normally happens pretty fast so within yeah, yeah. three or four days yeah. of us checking you out at four weeks yeah. uh, we may even do a, a four week scan just to check that everything's in place um, and then it's over to you for rehab mm. and then quite quickly patients are back doing non-impact exercise so on a static bike doing some swimming maybe using some cross trainers, a low resistance rower, just anything to get the knee moving and the range back. And that would be, what sort of mark would they be doing that? Three months? No, they'd be doing that sooner. So four and a half, five weeks post-surgery. Certainly on the, we get them on the bike quite quickly. Um, And that's what I've found is that 
I think people feel quite positive that they're actually not just losing. You know, it's it's more of a I don't know more of a natural operation, isn't it? Because you're actually well, the, what's the term? You're keeping the the anatomy. Yeah. It's yeah. Uh, you know, so I think they feel very positive about that. And that initial four to six weeks, I think once they're over that, it, it's quite straightforward yeah. normally from yeah. there, isn't it? Um, and then hopefully long term, they're in a much better yeah. position. Yeah. Now the big question we get. And I do know the answer, but I'd be interested to, well, I think I know the answer, is how do you know if it's repaired? Patients are always asking, they get a bit of pain and they're like, well, have I done something wrong? Or So when do you rescan, and when do you know that what you've done has repaired? That's a great question. <laughs> it's a really good question. And you, there's a number of ways that you can assess how well a meniscus has repaired or not. And that's down to the patient's symptoms, how, how good does it feel, uh, what activity they can get back to. Yeah. Uh, you examine them, so if they've got no, no swelling in the knee, no tenderness, no pain when you fully extend them, yeah. no pain when you twist the knee, it's called a McMurray's test, so that's all negative, that all bodes very well. Uh, I think I mentioned muscle, muscle mass restoring. Yeah. All, the, all these bode very well we not uncommonly rescan around three months. Yeah. Uh, often that's just for reassurance for me and for the patients. On the scans, to some degree, you can assess how well the meniscus re has repaired. And what's important is when you look at the meniscus, you don't want to be able to see uh, sort of a water signal where the meniscus tear was. Yeah. It may not heal completely solidly with perfect meniscal tissue, but as long as it heals with some form of scar tissue, that's enough for it to have kept the shock absorbing capacity right, of the meniscus yeah. and to protect the knee going forwards. Yeah, yeah. The gold standard would be to re, re arthroscope to the knee. To go back in. Yeah. Uh, but of course, no one does that. No. That, would, that would be a bit <laughs> mental. Yeah. Although there is something around called the nanoscope, right. uh, which the Americans are using probably over aggressively. Well, it's, a, it's a needle sized camera, about one oh, millimetre. Yeah, yeah in diameter that you can put into the knee in the outpatient wow. or in the office setting to yeah. have, a little, <laughs> have a little look inside the knee. But we, d we don't do that here. But that, as a surgeon, actually, if you did that, you'd, that would give you more confidence. That would give you, yeah. So some, 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 some guys are, are doing this to have yeah. a look, but it's, it's a bit experimental at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And it is, it's theoretically one of the indications for this yeah. new nanoscope. But if everything's going in the right direction, you're not going to do that, Correct, right? Yeah. You're just going to listen yeah. to the patient, yeah. they feel great, yeah. and they'll start Correct, start yeah. building back yeah. and as you said long term that should help to preserve the joint yeah. and that's the same if it's the medial or the lateral correct yes yeah. yeah. um and if you just i think we talked about it earlier but i'm just thinking like, if if i was a patient sitting there and i've just torn my meniscus and i've got a locked joint mm -hmm. will you get a better repair the sooner you go in and do that operation yes right because if it's been locked and if what happens is with time is that the, the, the fibers in the meniscus shorten. Right. So the longer it's locked out, the shorter the fibers become, the harder it, it, is, it is to put the meniscus back in place. Right, okay, so we are well, against and, the and, time. And, and the more tension there is on yeah. the repair, yeah. and you want it not to be under tension. And the most, this may be a silly question, but 15 years ago, not every orthopedic surgeon was doing repairs. True. I mean, there's a point where it was relatively new. Mm. Are, you know, in an NHS hospital now, are most surgeons gonna be sort of making this decision on a daily basis? I would think so, yeah. I, I would think so. I mean, it's certainly it's part of every orthopedic surgeon's armamentarium mm -hmm. to do a, a meniscal repair. Yeah, sure. Okay, anything else you wanna say about those acute meniscal repairs? No, I think. It's enough. the best option, isn't it? If you can, if, you, you know, if, you, if you're young and fit and active and yeah. you've got a, a significantly sized meniscal tear, yeah. Uh, and it's repairable, then I'd advise you to get it repaired. Yeah, okay, cool. Now, now there's gonna be the other group that we'll yeah. talk about. Well, actually, before we talk about the other group, so let's say you can't repair it. Can you just talk us through what you do in that, that if, situation so for if, the resection or meniscus? So in those tears that aren't repairable, you sadly have to remove those elements of the meniscus which are loose or unstable within the knee, and you only resect as little of the meniscus as possible. So uh, you want to keep as much of the rim of the meniscus intact to stabilize the knee. So you, right. you, when you reset the meniscus, you don't aggressively go in and remove the whole meniscus 
as which they did used to do, didn't which, they? Yeah, yeah, years yeah. ago that we used to do that back yeah, in the eighties. Take so. that out. Yeah, don't Pop do that, that down anymore. There. Yes. <laughs> Um, but now we're uh, terribly careful preserving as much of the meniscus as possible yeah. and we talk about carefully sculpting the meniscus to a nice smooth rim, preserving most of its integrity. Yeah, yeah. okay. And that's the one where if you do that post-operatively, pretty straightforward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, let's go on to the what, what is a massive group of patients that we see. So we're probably going getting a bit older now, yeah. probably late 30s, early 40s. Yeah. 50s and so always, yeah. and upwards exactly so this is more that wear and tear meniscal tear yes do you want to just talk to us just remind everybody a little bit about what that group of patients yeah are. so this, these are patients here somebody who's in their 50s and 60s walking the dog or someone playing a bit of doubles tennis i don't know just going shopping or yeah. something. and they just they get much similar but less much less severe uh changes and they, and they again they have localized pain some yeah. swelling doesn't feel comfortable going downstairs they feel a bit vulnerable you you take the history you get the story of how it how it came on it's normally come on more gradually there's a longer history weeks and months rather than days and weeks yeah yeah um so it's sort of been you, building up yeah. it's a bit more insidious yeah, it's yeah. built up over time yeah you examine them there's obvious muscle wages typically there's a joint effusion there's very focal joint line tenderness and you think uh, uh, this is a yeah. degenerate meniscal tear Again, they go off for an MRI scan, and the scan comes back and confirms your suspicions yeah. that, that it's a meniscal tear. Yeah. But so how does that look different on a scan compared to those acute? So here, the, the meniscus looks generally older and generally degenerate and generally more frayed, hence the old pair of jeans analogy that's a bit worn yeah. and frayed and torn. You often see a fatty signal within the meniscus, so the meniscus looks old. Yeah. Uh, on the scan, yeah. and it's called, you know, the, it gets reported as a degenerate complex meniscal tear. Yeah. Within that, there might be stable or unstable elements. So the important issue here is, is this meniscal tear stable? Right. In other words, is it just frayed and worn and torn, or is it very unstable with loose bits breaking around? Loose bits breaking around. Yeah. In either event, for a, a degenerate meniscal tear, you invariably give non-operative management, i.e. time, a bit of rest, exercise, physiotherapy, mm. a run for its money for a good few months. Yeah. And the great news is that about 70% or even more will settle with yeah. non-operative management like this. Yeah. Often way more, in fact, in my experience. Yeah, yeah. And so you tell the patients this is what they've got, you show them the scan, and then tell them the good news that the chances are that in three or four months' time, after some activity modification yeah. and physiotherapy, yeah. maybe or the injection of a, of a yeah. lubricant or a steroid to help calm the knee down, yeah. they'll, they'll be fine and back to where they were you know, be, yeah. before all this started. And the bit, I suppose, for those people that have been sort of diagnosed with those problems, it's very hard, isn't it, to predict, although a majority still get better with time, and mm -hmm. I think you have to be patient mm -hmm. with these things, it's hard to predict who's going to be the ones that do or don't get better or is there things that you yeah so notice? you do get a funny sense you've been doing this for decades <laughs> you, uh, you think well, uh, yeah but i mean you do you have to roll the dice and give everyone a, a chance yeah. and expect them to get better and yeah, yeah. three or four months minimum yeah yeah really. absolutely the only people type of patient i'm thinking where the and I'm, I'm putting words in your mouth so where an operation maybe is where they keep getting those acute flare-ups and yes. that sort of gives you the impression that something's moving around locking a bit yeah, yeah. so if if you're you know if who would it be it would be someone who's in their 50s or 60s who remains active yeah. and they're, they're just struggling and that's not getting better and they say oh, it keeps on giving way on me it keeps on catching yeah. keeps on locking up doc yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I sort of have to unlock it and yeah, yeah. clearly they've got a loose piece that's just not scarring up yeah because that's, that's what these fray bits of meniscus do they sort of scar scar up and sort of become stable yeah and that's what you want them to do so you even even in that subgroup i think you have to still say well mr smith this you've got to give this a bit of time yeah, if yeah. we don't want to have to operate unless we have to yeah so give it three months yeah, I mean, we've got quite a few patients that you've referred to us with exactly that at the moment. I've just come from the clinic, so they're in the gym. And generally, they're all getting better. That they're, they're, It takes time, but mm. it's exactly that. Whether it's the exercise, I think the exercise has helped, but at the same time, you are, you're waiting for this thing to scar mm. up. So as long as you don't just keep irritating it and yes. keep it quiet. Yeah, so it's activity modification. So yeah. 
they've got to cut back on their walking. Again, you want them doing non-impact, non-twisting yeah. exercise. Ask them to be careful going up and down stairs, careful yeah. on the escalators, careful on the pavements, careful on the cobblestones. Yeah. Just look after their knee and you know, do their homework and do their exercises with you. And then fingers crossed they'll be dancing yeah. and, out a, and in, a majority in a do, months, yeah. don't they? Mm. Just giving it giving it giving it time. Mm. Are there situation there are still situations, I believe, where you potentially would operate on these, but those are the ones where you've given it time and it's just not getting anywhere. Yes, I, like I said, I have this sort of three month rule. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's way over seventy yeah. percent of these will settle. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, and then that sort of leads us into where I want to go to talk about with this older age group, mm -hmm. which and how this links into meniscal tears, which is arthritis mm -hmm. or osteoarthritis. So, and we talk a lot about, well, certainly from working with patients where they do have arthritis and a meniscal tear. Yes. How does that influence your decision making? Does it influence it? And what sort of other management strategies might come into place at that point? Whoa, there's a lot of questions in Yeah, this. so the first question <laughs> is, if you've got a patient with a degenerative meniscal tear with no arthritis compared to a degenerative meniscal tear with arthritis? Um, well, you'll still go down the same path for both of them. <clears throat> it's just that the, the prognosis, in my experience, for patients with degenerative meniscal tears with arthritis if you dive in and arthroscope that subgroup, yeah. they're more likely to be unhappy than happy. Yeah, I've uh, definitely seen that. Not not of <laughs> any of your patients, on, yeah. but there's I've definitely seen less now, but certainly five ten years ago, where people were having operations, keyhole surgery, basically on an arthrotomy. Yeah. And, yeah. and sometimes it would help, but you'd often see they end up with this really swollen synovitic type presentation. Yes, yeah, so the mistake that can be made is someone presents with an arthritic knee and as a bit of a sideshow they've actually got a degenerate meniscal tear. Mm. The doctor thinks the degenerate meniscal tear is the main source of the problem, mm. removes that so the knee has lost more of its shock absorption and the arthritis then accelerates. So it really yeah, is yeah. a bad idea yeah, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, um, so Degenerate meniscal tears in a <coughs> degenerate knee. <coughs> Again, very much conservative options uh, are, are supported. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they um, generally do um, pretty well with physio pain management activity modification, and we really work on. And even in older patients, we get them in the gym. We get them, you know, doing mm. leg press, leg extension, and building up the quadriceps particularly. And we've got lots of techniques to try and build that mm. up. And Generally speaking, people do really well. Losing a bit of weight can definitely help with knee Poor, pain. Yeah. Changing your lifestyle a little bit. Yeah. Um, all of these things that, that can be very helpful. So let's go on now to osteoarthritis. Yes. Okay. Yep. So massive you know, group of patients that we see, 40 to 70, 50 to 70 year old males and females, probably more male than female, yeah, probably. Um, with osteoarthritis of the knee, probably associated with a meniscal tear, because as we've discussed, they often go together. Yeah. We're not gonna focus on knee replacements mm -hmm. at this stage, because I think everybody knows if they've got arthritic, an arthritic knee, there is always the option of a knee replacement at some point, but many people want to avoid it. Mm. They are limited after a knee replacement mm. to a certain extent. It's great for reducing pain, but they can be limited functionally. So for that active person, imagine so, you, what are your knees like? Touch wood, pretty good. Pretty good, which is good for an orthopedic surgeon. Never had your, your meniscus taken out. I had a, I had a meniscectomy, God, 21 years ago. Oh, wow. T touch wood, it's okay. I can still ski on it, which is right. That's not bad. Mm. Do you know whether it actually has any wear and tear on it? It does, actually. So I had some, I had a scan done a couple of years ago. So that it was a big lateral meniscal tear oh. and with a go. big cyst and it had most of it removed. Um, but it, it lets me know occasionally, but I, I, I can do everything apart from run on it. Okay. Do you enjoy running? No. So we fine. see a lot of clients that are like, they're, all they want to do is run on it. Yeah. But that's definitely uh, something to think about carefully. Okay, so let's say your knee started to get sore. I hope it doesn't, mm. Simon. Okay. You're obviously not going to have a knee replacement. You want to keep skiing. So actually, you are you are that classic group mm. that want to stay, you know, we have an aging population, but we have a, a very active aging population. Yeah. What are your options 
obviously I'm going to start with physiotherapy, yeah. which is obviously where we should start with this, and I think that will have a role. But what would you advise to patients? So to physiotherapy, obviously weight reduction, you've mentioned before, that's super important. Really important. Because the knees yeah. are just levers. As we get it up out of our chairs, for example, we're putting nine or ten times our body weight through the knees. So if you're 10 kilos over, that's 100 kilos of force going through your force, force through your knee, which doesn't need to. But going on to the other other treatments that you're alluding to, injectables. Yes. So injectables are, are, are very effective in my experience, and I think your experience too. So yeah, absolutely, uh, we recommend injection. But there's a lot of options, isn't there, yeah. out there, and there's mm -hmm. becoming more and more options and i think it'd be really good to get your opinion around what are the options i suppose but what's your because i know you do lots of quite you know no, um, novel um, injections as well um, yes yeah, so surgery. the more conventional injections would be the ones that have been around for years so injecting steroids into a knee mm -hmm. uh, these are done typically under ultrasound control by one of our radiologists mm -hmm. or by yes your good self in clinic and the steroids will dampen down the pain for a few weeks or a few months and help break that cycle of pain, help patients get back to doing more strength training and that can be very effective. Yeah. Then there's the lubricant, something called hyaluronic acid and that comes in various shapes and forms, various viscosities, various strengths, various shelf lives associated with it. I use something called Synvisc1 which is supposed to be the more long acting of the variants yeah. and that can produce symptomatic relief for up to six months and these injections can be repeated. Uh, the insurers, though, will often pay for a limited number of these. Yeah. Um, and then Europe-wide and across North America, there's a huge uh, take-up of something called PRP. These are the blood injections that patients will hear about or read about. This is where you have uh, some blood taken out of your arm, get a centrifuge down and inject it into your knee. Mm. And this is called a platelet-rich plasma. And there are loads of studies out there that suggest that's just as good, if not more effective, than the lubricant injections. It, particularly in knees, which yeah. is what we're talking about, yeah. absolutely. So yeah. osteoarthritis of knees, it's, it can be very effective. The problem at the moment is the insurers aren't funding it as they don't believe that the, uh, the data is strong enough to support them funding it. So a lot of patients have to dip into their own pocket and pay for it themselves. Uh, and then you can go uh, off track a bit if you want to, and explore other cellular options. Mm. So other cellular options include what are called inverted commas stem cells where you can you can extract uh, a type of stem cell from your bone marrow and have that injected into your knee. Yeah. But you're starting to get very experimental when yeah. you're talking about this yeah. and also very expensive. Yeah, so I've certainly had a few clients that you've done what BMAC yeah. to this bone marrow and they've actually it's, they've done very well with it. So can you give us a bit more because I'm sure Although not everybody's going to go for it, I think it's good for people to be aware of what's out there. And I think you've alluded to it already. It, is, it does become experimental. Yeah. Um, and obviously patients just need to weigh up cost versus risk versus benefit. But just give us an idea because I'm interested in the process of BMAC and, and how that works. So and, and more importantly, what clients do you think do well with it? So... Bone marrow aspirate concentration injection, as I say, is experimental, and you have to be completely clear that this is the case. It involves the patient having a light anaesthetic, they have a needle put into their hip, uh, the bone marrow gets aspirated from the hip bone, centrifuged down, and injected into their knee at the same sitting. Mm. Um, again, it's used much more in North America and other centres in Europe than it is in the UK. We've probably done, in total, only about 40 patients. Yeah. Uh, it's been invariably done for osteoarthritic knees. Occasionally, patients will come in and request other joints be injected. But it's just, it's just, it represents a tiny percentage mm. of the patients we treat. And do you think those patients are coming to you, they've read a bit about it, or is it, you know, how do you think they're ending up having it done, I suppose? Um, so it's, some patients would have, just sourced us in, indirectly and, yeah. and, and come and ask me, you know, do you do this and how much will it cost and yeah. how effective is it? And what happens is you say, well, it's experimental. You must go down the standard route of treatment first, first and so right, you must yeah. try everything else first. Yeah. And then, uh, then you would go on and, and talk about all the pros and cons of it. Um, and just anecdotally from those 40 patients, 
What's your feeling on how effective it's been? Probably about two thirds to three quarters well, to see a good, good result. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's 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 reasonable, but it's expensive and it's yeah, experimental. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so as lo- I think as long as you make that clear to patients, then it's um, it's it's it you know it's something that they can then if they can choose how to spend their money to a certain extent. Yeah, but I also think it's very important that they try everything else first. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can have a billionaire walk in here and he says yeah. he wants he wants BMAC and you say, well, yeah. no, you're trying everything else first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. My, I've been, as you know, I've been doing ultrasound guide injections probably for about 15 years and we do, we use steroid, which I really like for that acutely swollen mm-hmm. synovitic knee, just to, as you said, break that mm-hmm. cycle and give that patient the opportunity to exercise a bit, strengthen the knee, maybe lose a bit of weight mm-hmm. and use that three or four months, hopefully, to, to get that. The hyaluronic acids I've used, again, for a very long time, Austinol, Duralane, um, and I think for a mild to moderate arthritic knee or, or somebody that also has a bit of a degenerative meniscus mm-hmm. that isn't overweight, that's pretty active, I think that's a really nice um, uh, a solution for some of them, but it is something that needs to be repeated. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the great thing about hyaluronic acid is it's not a drug, so side effect profile mm-hmm. is, is extremely low. Yeah. And sometimes you can obviously combine the steroid and the hyaluronic acid. Yeah, we which often is, do. Yeah, we often do. Which I think is a nice combination. And then PRP I got into about five years ago, partly because of the trials mm-hmm. that came out, the, the, the randomized controlled trials around the knee. But also I was definitely getting a group of patients um, that had that mild to moderate arthritis that were very active, lots of tennis players around here, mm-hmm. um, that wanted to try something. They maybe tried hyaluronic mm-hmm. acid, but it hadn't worked. Mm-hmm. And th- a lot of people do want to avoid steroid, but certainly long term, I don't think you win with steroid. I think you're, yeah. you know, you often it, it, you know, you have that diminishing effect of how much it helps. And I think with PRP, I would say 50% get a, a, a good result that they're really happy with how and many, the other 50 how many injections do you give or offer, offer your patients yeah it's a good question so i did one this morning and i'm just doing one on them mm-hmm. and we're going to see how they go um i've done people that i've done two on and then i've had people that we've done three on mm-hmm. most of the studies particularly that as you say come from north america do three injections mm-hmm. But you have to weigh that up with yeah, cost yeah. and that sort of thing. But I think certainly doing three injections doesn't do any harm. Mm. There's probably a ceiling effect yeah. where you might as well not do any more. Mm. So I think if I would go for three mm. if 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 people wanted to go for the full thing. Yeah. But I don't think most most the studies would generally say three. But yeah. anecdotally, I've had good results with one, with two. I've had patients that have done one. They've come back two months later and had a second. Um, so I don't think it, you have to have three, but I don't think it's certainly not going to do you any harm. Um, it just costs more money. <laughs> the other thing we've not talked about is knee offloader braces. Well, we should talk about it. Yeah. yeah. So they become more and more popular. So uh, just for patients, uh, when you have osteoarthritis of your knee, you need to understand that the knee joint is three, three separate compartments. You have one joint where the kneecap articulates with the femur called the patellofemoral joint. Then you have an inside joint and an outside joint called the medial and lateral tibiofemoral joints. And if you have arthritis on the inside joint, which is the most common, less so on the outside joint, you can have very localized wear. So each knee is three joints and we talk about unicompartmental or tricompartmental osteoarthritis. Now if you've got arthritis just affecting one compartment, all your pain is coming from one third of the knee. And if you can have a knee brace that will take the stress away from that warm bit of the knee, that's very, very effective. Uh, Combined with weight loss, physiotherapy and injectables, you can often get someone uh, or stop stop someone needing a joint replacement for many 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 years. Yeah, yeah, and certainly we've stu- and obviously the brace that we generally mm. favour is the Ossa offloader yeah. brace. I'm sure there's some others too, but um, and it's quite lightweight. Patients can wear it quite a lot because mm. people often go, well, I can't be bothered to wear that brace, but actually it is quite lightweight and yeah. Quite once they've got used to using it, yeah, they, they like it. It's like putting their socks on in the yeah. morning. They yeah. put their brace on, um, and it's, and there are trials, aren't there? There are some some a, a few good scientific mm. trials that show that you can really delay mm. the requirement for a knee replacement, yeah. and we've certainly had success with it. And I think one of the key messages 
that I try and get across to patients like you do too is often there's not one answer to this and yeah. actually that multimodal type approach mm. so weight loss physiotherapy mm. exercise based treatment maybe a brace mm. maybe an injection yeah that sort of combination yeah. I think is probably the best option we have and there's never going to be that holy grail for arthritis I don't think um, and I think having that combination of treatment I'd say a significant percentage of patients do well but then there is definitely a group where basically the knees had it yes <laughs> and it doesn't matter what wonderful injection you've got or what wonderful exercise you've got for somebody essentially they're gonna need a knee replacement Sadly, yes. Yeah. yeah, and we definitely don't have the answer, I don't think, for, for osteoarthritis at this present moment. Because, But the other thing to mention as well, we haven't talked about it, but on an X-ray or an MRI, you can have a terrible-looking knee, can't you, <laughs> that actually causes no pain at all. And yeah. then we see the other side where somebody walks in in agony, limping, mm. can hardly move their knee, and you do a scan, and it's like, Not well, that bad. actually, why is that? I really wish I knew the answer yeah. to that. There's no, there's no, no, there isn't an answer to that. Right. Some of these scans, they have this sort of acute bone marrow edema syndrome. Yeah. What that means in English is that the bone underneath the arthritis has suddenly got very, very inflamed. And I think probably what's happened is a small crack has developed in the cartilage fluid has leaked through that crack into the bone marrow. And that's why they suddenly become so painful. Right. And that, that sets off like an inflammatory yeah, an, an inflammatory process in the knee. Yeah. And then you need to have really, really rest the knee and offload it. Yeah, yeah. And again, that's one of the uses for the offloader brace as yeah. well. Yeah, when yeah. you get an acute flare-up of a more chronic arthritis. Yeah. yeah, normally on the medial side again? Typically. Yeah, yeah. Typically. Yeah. But the great thing about this offloader brace is they, if they're fitted properly, they as you know, go the other side, you can yeah. use one for the other side. And yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, a lot of patients are loving, loving those and, and yeah, yeah. avoiding or well, putting knee replacement surgery off for many, many years. Yeah, yeah. Mm. perfect. Okay, well, I think that we've covered, we've covered an awful lot and hopefully people find that helpful. I think the key messages are is if you're quite young and you've had a meniscal tear, is that ideally, if, ideally obviously, you don't have an operation if you don't need one, but if you do need one, hopefully they could, there can be a repair, but bear in mind that the rehab can be quite slow yeah. because you've got to respect times of healing. You can't suddenly yeah. speed that up. Um, and then, obviously, if you've got something more of a degenerative meniscus, which lots of people mm -hmm. will have, that you need to give that time, Correct. and you're certainly not going to be rushing to a surgeon necessarily. Yeah. Um, and then when it comes to arthritis, I think yeah, we've summed up really that you need to throw a few different things at it, a few different treatment mm. options, because it's unlikely that we've got that one options that's just going to cure everything yeah. and that we need to have that sort of um, combination of treatments um, to, to improve things. So, Simon, thank you very much for your time. Thoroughly enjoyed it. I've yeah, learned a lot. Me too. Thank and, you. And um, yeah, thanks very much. All right. Thanks.